Welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is Fritjof Capra. Fritjof is a world-renowned physicist, systems theorist, educator, activist, and best-selling author. He received his PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Vienna in 1966, has spent 20 years doing research in theoretical high-energy physics at many respected universities, including the University of Paris, University of California at Santa Cruz, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, Imperial College London, and the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory at the University of California. His many books include The Tao of Physics, The Turning Point, The Web of Life, The Hidden Connections, and many others. His most recent book, co-authored with Pierre Luigi Luisi, is The Systems View of Life, and Fritjof is currently teaching an online course based around the subject matter called Capra Course. Fritjof is also renowned for his work in the ecology movement. He's a founding director of the Berkeley-based Centre for Eco-Literacy. He's a fellow of Schumacher College in the UK and is a council member of the Earth Charter Initiative. In today's conversation, we discuss the systems view of life, as well as the living mirror theory as a solution to the hard problem of consciousness. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, so I'm here with Fritjof Capra. Fritjof, thanks for coming on the podcast. The pleasure. Thanks for having me on the program. Yeah, you're welcome. So today we're going to be talking a lot about how life and the mind emerge out of the physical world. Um, and your initial training was in physics, right? So maybe that's a good place to start because you had this, um, this best-selling book in the 70s, The Tao of Physics, which is a wonderful book I highly recommend, um, drawing the kind of links between the worldviews of Eastern religions and modern physics. So would it be possible to give a bit of an outline of the perspective you were offering there? Yeah. Well, let, let me tell you that, uh, to give you a little bit of, of background, that I grew up in a family in Austria, in Innsbruck, uh, with uh, a mother who was a poet and a father who was a lawyer but an amateur philosopher and who had lots of philosophy books that he studied. And so in our family around the dinner table, there was always a lot of conversation about art, about philosophy, about literature. And then I, when I was in high school, I became interested in mathematics and then in physics and then got a PhD in physics. Uh, but from my student days, I have always been interested in the philosophy of modern physics. Uh, a big influence was Werner Heisenberg and his classic book, Physics and Philosophy, where he describes the conceptual revolution that happened in quantum physics in the 1920s, uh, 1930s. And uh, so then in the 1960s, I got interested in Eastern philosophies, in uh, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, I uh, began uh, meditation, I experimented with psychedelics as many of us did in the 60s and I read a lot about uh, Eastern philosophies and almost immediately I saw very striking parallels between the basic ideas in these Eastern mystical traditions and the quantum physics as described by Heisenberg. And so then I, I studied these parallels more and ended up writing this book, The Tao of Physics, which was published in 1975. And uh, basically, my basic thesis is that uh, the uh, worldview of physics and of mystics, uh, which uh, seem totally different disciplines, totally different fields, actually have a lot in common. Uh, to begin with, both approaches are thoroughly empirical. We know that the scientific method is empirical, of course, but also mystical traditions always emphasize uh, about, emphasize experience and emphasize using the body as an instrument for experience in, in meditation. And some describe physiological processes in, in great detail in, in, in the yoga traditions, for example. And um, so both approaches are empirical and both make observations in realms that are far removed from our ordinary experience. In, in quantum physics, this is the realm of atoms and subatomic particles, the realm of the very small. And in, uh, 
In mystical traditions, this is a realm of states of consciousness, which are non-ordinary states of consciousness in which we experience the world very differently. And it so happens that both of these extraordinary experiences, which uh, the um, proponents on both sides describe often as um, not being uh, possible to express in, in ordinary language, uh, experiences that go beyond our ordinary concepts. So it, it so happens that um, they see the world in very similar ways. And to me, this was a very beautiful confirmation of the, the old Hindu concept that the world within and the world without are the same, or as they say, Brahman and Atman are, are the same. So, so that's the basic thesis. And then, you know, I, I explored the concepts of quantum physics, of relativity theory, of quantum field theory, S-matrix theory, and so on. I uh, should mention that I spent 20 years doing research in particle physics, high energy physics. And so I could draw on this knowledge to uh, explain the basic concepts of physics to a lay audience. And, and uh, the book was successful beyond my wildest dreams and became a huge international bestseller. Yeah, so that's it's a, the story. It's a wonderful book. Um, I see why it sold so well. And I think the, um, when it comes to the kind of mysteries of quantum mechanics, I feel like the way that you, the, the explanation you offer in understanding, you know, this kind of systems holistic picture of, of, of reality effectively seems just to offer a lot of clarity as to these phenomena that are going on that doesn't come from an, a reductionistic understanding if you want to understand the individual right. particles alone. And did, was this for you a way into to thinking about the differences between reductionist thinking and systems thinking? Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, um, the, the basic uh, uh, characteristic of uh, the worldview, well, actually two, two basic characteristics of the worldview of modern physics. One is the fundamental interconnectedness and interdependence of all phenomena. When you go down to the atomic and subatomic world, there are no more isolated objects. You encounter a network of relationships. And whatever you call an object is something that you somehow isolate out of that network. You draw an, an artificial boundary, a rather arbitrary boundary, and then calls something, you know, an object, uh, a, a molecule, an atom, uh, an electron, you know, a, a Higgs boson to take another extreme. And, um, but these are not isolated objects. These are energy patterns that are connected to everything else in the environment. And in fact, they derive their basic properties from their connections to the environment, to, to other things in the environment. So this fundamental interconnectedness and interdependence is one basic characteristics characteristic. The other one is the intrinsically dynamic nature of the material world. So these patterns, I call them energy patterns because they're patterns of activity. So the subatomic world is intrinsically dynamic. And I found both of these reflected in, in the Eastern worldview. And, uh, you know, as, as I wrote the book, by the time, you know, I finished the book, I uh, reflected in, in the epilogue that this worldview uh, of the Eastern spiritual traditions, which shows these great similarities to the worldview emerging from modern physics, is very different from the dominant worldview in our society, which is a mechanistic and a reductionist worldview. And so I, uh, I thought that that physics would lead um, to a change, uh, you know, far beyond its, its um, discipline. And this is what I explored in, in my second book, The Turning Point. 
And what happened then was, I should, I should mention that during the 1960s, which were my formative period, I was uh, influenced not only by uh, spiritual traditions, but also by the social movements in the 1960s, <clears throat> by the student movement, the civil rights movement in the United States, uh, the, the so-called Prague Spring uh, resistance against, uh, you know, the communist Soviet Union. Uh, there, were, there were liberation movements, there was feminism, there were liberation movements within, uh, say, the medical field and, and so on. And, and there was a, just a very widespread questioning of authority and questioning of, you know, the social structures we were living in. And so I got very attracted to that. And, and so my, uh, my basic idea was uh, that the sciences have all modeled themselves after classical Newtonian physics. And now that we have a new physics, you know, quantum physics and relativity theory, it's time for the other sciences to take uh, uh, notice of that. And can they model themselves after the new physics? And then I uh, made a big uh, shift, a big discovery, because I realized that the social issues I became interested in, like uh, health, uh, social justice, protection of the environment, um, management of human organizations, uh, and so on, that these all had to do with living systems, with individual organisms, with social systems, with ecosystems. And I realized that physics has nothing to say about life. It cannot describe the very essence of life. And so I shifted from physics to the life sciences. I was very much influenced at the time by Gregory Bateson, whom I knew quite well and I had many discussions with him. And uh, uh, I, I tell you a, a funny anecdote in the way he pointed out to me that physics was really limited when it came to life. Uh, he came to very early on in around 1978, he came to one of my seminars and then he said to a common friend, which was then reported to me, uh, he said, Capra, the man is crazy. He thinks we're all electrons. <laughs> and so with this very witty formulation, he put his finger on, on the dilemma that I had, that I was trying to model the life sciences, you know, after physics. And so, so my interest shifted and, and that's how I discovered systems thinking. You know, I read Ludwig von Bertalanffy's uh, general systems theory. I, I studied the writings of the cyberneticists, uh, studied self-organization, and then on to Prigogine, Maturana, Varela, Bateson, of course, uh, Lynn Margulis, and various other uh, systemic thinkers. And uh, this, this began in the... Um, in the 1980s, early 1980s, and uh, went on for about 30 years. And I ended up with a grand synthesis of what I now call the systems view of life, which is uh, an understanding of life in terms of relationships, in terms of patterns, in terms of connectedness. Right, and so I guess the, um, the anecdote you just told, I guess, is a good, um illustration of, of the limitations of reductionist thinking, right? If you think life is just electrons, if it's truly in the parts, you, you can't explain the phenomenon, right? And the phenomena exist at the level of the whole system at a holistic level. Um, right. it, it might be worth diving into um, the kind of the general idea of the system's view of life in, in understanding uh, life this way is, um, well, I was going to say, is, is the idea of life as, as a kind of network system a good place to start? Well, before that even, I think the, the critical uh, change and the critical advance is uh, to say that the basic characteristic of life is a pattern. 
uh, the, uh, the, in the 1950s and 1960s, there were these big breakthroughs, uh, the discovery of the structure of DNA, the genetic code, which gave rise to the whole field of molecular biology. And so when you ask, still today, when you ask biologists, um, what is the nature of life? Uh, they would point to, to cells, they would point to these macromolecules, proteins, you know, DNA, RNA, and, and, you know, some might just say a living system is a, uh, a chemical system that contains DNA. That's all you need to know. If you, if you look for DNA, if you find DNA, it's alive. If you don't find DNA, it's not alive. But the problem with that is that a dead organism also contains DNA, contains the very same DNA. It doesn't disappear. So any piece of wood, a uh, piece of bone um, uh, has the same DNA. Um, and so um, what is really the essential difference between you know, a living and a dead organism is the basic process of life. And this basic process of life uh, which sages and poets for centuries have called the breath of life, is now in science is, is known as metabolism. And it is defined as a ceaseless flow of energy and matter through a network of biological, biochemical, a network of biochemical processes, um, which allows uh, the system to continually regenerate and perpetuate itself. And so there are two aspects here to this concept of metabolism, the flow aspect and the network aspect. And, and, and that is the, the, the very essence of the system's view. And so is the, um, I guess, the concept of autopoiesis, the, uh, the idea of the system being a self-generating, self-creating system, Right. That's one side of this, right? Not, that's right. Not every network is a living network. So these networks have been studied very carefully. And, uh, you know, Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela in Chile came up with this theory of autopoiesis, which means self-making, um, that, that living networks are continually self-generating. So in a cell, the simplest living network, in a cell, each, uh, each uh, of the structures of the cell, the relatively large structures, the proteins, the membranes, the DNA, the RNA, and so on, all these uh, large molecules are continually produced by the cellular network. What, uh, what comes in from the outside is food, this stream of energy and matter, small molecules, sugars and other small molecules. And then out of those constituents, the cellular network produces the larger pieces. And as soon as the larger pieces are produced, like an enzyme, for instance, it will contribute to the network, helping to produce other pieces. So there are continual production processes going on and continual recycling. And so we see that biological life continually regenerates itself. That's, that's the basic idea of, of autopoiesis. And so, so this is a big breakthrough because uh, first of all, it's a shift of emphasis from structures to patterns. And of course, I, I should say, in order to really understand how a cell works, you need to know the biochemistry. It's not enough to say it's a self-generating network. Uh, you have to ask, what are the production processes? What kind of molecules are involved? What kind of chemistry is involved? So that's all still valuable. But that alone, the chemistry alone, doesn't give you the answer to the essence of life. The essence of life is the pattern of uh, uh, self-generation. And uh, this pattern of uh, continual regeneration 
requires this flow of energy. So the flow aspect is absolutely necessary because something that continually regenerates itself and recycles its components needs to be fed from the outside, cannot survive in a vacuum. And, and so the flow aspect is, is partly, is, uh, you know, part of it. And so the concept of metabolism combines those two. I, I learned this from the great microbiologist Lynn Margulis, who would say, uh, if you ask whether something is alive, she would say, look whether it metabolizes. If it metabolizes, it's alive. If it doesn't metabolize, it's not alive. So th that's a very, and I think that's for lay people, that's a good way of understanding life because we all know about metabolism. We have the experience of being able to survive only when we breathe and eat and drink and so on. So, so that's, that's common experience and that's true for life at, at all levels of life. Right, and I, I think this, this core idea of life being a pattern that propagates itself um, I think, you know, there are people who you often hear it said that we just don't understand life, we don't understand the origins of life. But to me, this insight, the idea that it's possible for patterns to exist that can propagate themselves is, is an incredibly powerful um, explanation as to why we see these vastly complex systems around, you know, and to me, it's the same or related insight to the kind of systems understanding of Darwinian natural selection and evolution, yeah. because yeah. you know it may seem very improbable that you have these structures, but all the ones that didn't propagate themselves successfully, we don't see those, and we only see the the improbable ones that managed to propagate themselves. And and there's another interesting relation to evolution, and that comes from the flow aspect of metabolism, and this also has been studied extensively over the last thirty years or so. And um, what, what has been discovered with the, uh, the mathematical tools of complexity theory uh, is that um, living systems generally uh, are able to maintain themselves in a state of balance. And we all know that that's well known that, for example, when when you are in a certain environment, uh, like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a shirt because it's warm right now in Berkeley. Uh, it will be quite hot actually in the afternoon. Now, when I go out in the afternoon, there's a big change of temperature of, of several degrees, but my body temperature doesn't change very much, maybe a tiny bit. So there's something called homeostasis that the organism is able to maintain itself in a state of balance. But what the big discovery is of the last 30 years is that every now and then such a, a system, which is an open system, open to the flow of energy and matter, and in this flow every now and then uh, a system may encounter an instability, and at that instability where the entire system becomes unstable, it may either break down and die, but much more frequently it will break through to a new state of order and a, a new state of organization and behavior. And this process which uh, um, uh, involves the emergence, the spontaneous emergence of novelty, of new forms of order, is nowadays uh, generally called as emergence. It's, it's just called emergence and it has been recognized as the dynamic origin of development, of learning, and of evolution. And so the big discovery is that any open system in, and we could talk about more what the characteristics are, any system that is continually processing flows of energy and matter and staying in balance at the same time will go through these processes of emergence, there's always the potential of novelty. And so evolution does not begin with adaptation to the environment, although that's an important part of it, but evolution begins with the natural tendency 
of life to reach out for novelty, to, to, um, to have the emergence of new forms of order. That's, that's the basic uh, dynamic of evolution. And then the systems view, if I can just go on and say uh, yeah, one more yeah. thing, the, the systems view also, well, first let, let me say that the systems view acknowledges the basic insight of Darwin, which was a tremendous insight that we are all interlinked by common ancestry. So the Darwinian vision is a vision of a vast network of living organisms in space and time, interlinked in space and time through common ancestry. So it's a thoroughly uh, holistic and systemic vision. And what, what, and Darwin also recognized the force of natural selection he didn't understand in detail how changes would take place. And that came with the uh, discovery of genetics and genetic mutations. But what the systems view adds is that genetic mutations are not the only source of change. There are two more sources of change. One is the free exchange of genes by bacteria, which occurs regularly. And uh, the other one is symbiosis, uh, the, the tight living together of two different species of one living inside the other, typically a microorganism living inside a larger cell and cooperating in such a tight way as to um, give rise to a new species of organism. So this is called symbiogenesis. And this theory was promoted um, uh, very strongly by Lynn Margulis. And so now we have three avenues of evolution. And what happens in all these three avenues is uh, there is a new genome that is, is created either through, through genetic mutations or through an organism acquiring genes of a bacterium or for an organism uh, entering into permanent symbiotic relationship with an organi uh, organism. So in all three cases, there is a new genome that arises. And then now natural selection means that this genome has to function within a certain genetic and cellular environment, which means it has to be integrated into this environment. And this is a highly ordered process. So we see that evolution has random elements. All three avenues of the creation of the new genome have random elements, but the overall process of integrating it into a new functioning organism or species is a highly ordered process. And so that's, that's also a big uh, discovery. It's not all random and natural selection. Yeah. There's great order. Right. And I think that's um, a beautiful idea that the, um, the niche that the organism ends up fulfilling is where the order comes in, as, as far as I can see. You know, there's a sense in which um, a bird is nothing more than the kind of manifestation of the potential for life to inhabit that niche. You know, it's, the, it's this radical interconnectedness where birds don't exist if plants don't exist and if the sun isn't, you know, if we're not in the solar system orbiting a sun. Um, and so you can see that, yeah, while there's all of this um, randomness and creativity, it gets funneled through, um, it gets funneled into places where there is order uh, that gets manifested in the organism. Um, yeah, and you, and, I like what you say, James, because uh, what you just said mirrors what I said before about subatomic physics, that, mm. that properties, the basic properties of a particle derive from its interactions with other particles. So the, the basic properties of a bird, the type of feathers it has, the type of wingspan, the type of food it eats, you know, all these basic properties derive from the niche in which it lives. Right. And I think something I suspect we maybe agree on um, 
tell me if, if I'm wrong, um, is the idea that that uh, the concept of process is really, uh, you know, maybe if you want to say metaphysically, it's the kind of the foundation of understanding the world. Effectively, all is process. Life is a process. Even matter, it can be understood as a process. Yes, it's it's a process and it's a patterned process. Right. And we can study the patterns of, of the process. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And that's why I guess this this these same principles fall out at the same levels, whether it's subatomic particles or, or living systems or the entire ecosystem. Right. We see right. the systems perspective is very, very powerful. Yeah. Um and I guess it's so, on on the sorry, Lee, you go. I was just thinking that we have a lot that we agree on before we come to the disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we should jump into that. Uh, before we do, I wanted to um, uh, just mention that you, we were talking about homeostasis and the way that patterns of life uh, kind of maintain their, their order within a certain kind of uh, viable, viable range. And it seems that this is where the phenomenon of healing comes from, right? That we can, if you cut yourself, you, it kind of, it heals in a way that has to be understood as the entire pattern propagating itself. And you, you worked with uh, Stan Groff, right? Who, who's a real giant in the area right. of, of working with altered states of consciousness for healing. And it seems to me that, that altered states are ones in which the system is temporarily disrupted so that it can return to some healthy, kind of homeostatic balance. Is, does that resonate with you? Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, I, can link to, I can link this to the theory of autopoiesis. Uh, in, uh, according to Maturana and Varela, a, a living system interacts to um, influences from the environment, which they call disturbances. Uh, it reacts to a disturbance with uh, structural changes in the system. And it does so in a self-organizing way. The environment will trigger the structural changes, but it will not direct them. And what is more, the, the living system um, will decide which disturbances to react to. And that depends on, on the sensory apparatus and on the whole structure of the system. So, you know, according to the complexity of the organism, it will perceive certain things in the environment and others it will not perceive. And, but the response to, to these disturbances is self, a self-organizing response. And so coming back to Stan Groff, you could say he creates disturbances in the psyche of people. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the organism, including the mind and the body, and we, we should come to discuss what, what do we need by mind, but <laughs> the, the mind or the consciousness of the person will respond to the disturbance in a self-organizing way. And the skill of the therapist would be to create the proper disturbances that lead to a healing process. Right. But the healing and process is always a process of self-organization. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned that we should uh, maybe turn to the concept of, of mind and, you know, because very much related to this is, is the idea that um, we can understand the mind as emerging out of the life process, right? So there's this, the ma mainstream understanding in, in, well, the mainstream perspective, I would say in psychology and neuroscience is of, of the brain as a computer that deals with symbols and representations of, an, of a pre-existing world that exists outside of us. Um, and I think right. you and I both agree that that's not a use, that's not the, um, perhaps the best way to understand where the where mind emerges in the natural world and that it's actually a kind of feature of, of the life process. Yeah, and, and this to me is maybe the biggest discovery of, of the whole systemic understanding of the life. It, I shouldn't say the biggest discovery, but, but it's the most radical discovery also philosophically speaking, because it leads to a radically new 
concept of mind and consciousness. And, and just to go into this a little bit, the conventional view of uh, mind and body uh, was shaped in the 17th century, at least in, in Western culture and philosophy, was shaped by Descartes, who based his view of nature on the distinction between two fundamentally different and separate realms, uh, that of mind, which he called the thinking thing, res cogitans in, in Latin, and that of matter, the extended thing, res extensa. And ever since Descartes, scientists and philosophers have been thinking of the mind as a thing, you know, the thinking thing. And they couldn't figure out how this thinking thing interacted with matter. So the big advance, the huge advance in, in system science is to see the mind not as a thing, but as a process. And uh, Maturana and Varela uh, and Bate to begin with Bateson and then Maturana and Varela created a theory which is now known as the Santiago theory of cognition, cognition being the process of knowing, where they say the process of knowing and the process of life are one and the same. So, so that cognition is the continual self-generation of uh, living networks. That process of self-generation is a cognitive process. And this responds to environmental dis disturbances, disturbances from the environment, which I talked about before. The self-organizing response is a cognitive response. And in fact, you down to details and say the basic process of cognition, the unit of cognition, if you wish, is the process of structural change triggered by an environmental disturbance. And uh, so, as, as I said before, different organisms perceive different things in the environment and um, different disturbances, a certain range of disturbances will trigger structural changes. Other disturbances will just go through and, and not trigger anything. And the, the disturbances which do trigger the structural changes are what Maturana calls the cognitive domain of, of the organism. So the world is not a world, a pre-existing world that is represented by the organism, but is a world that is constructed, or as Maturana and Varela say, brought forth. It is brought forth by the organism in the process of living. So that's a huge difference. And I've been very excited about this Santiago theory because for me, this is the first theory in uh, Western science, which really overcomes the Cartesian division. So mind and matter are no longer different realms, but are different aspects of the same phenomenon of life. One is the structure aspect that would be matter, and the other one is the process aspect that would be mind. And the pattern of life is the unifying uh, phenomenon. Okay. And so that um, is used to explain, as you say, cognition. And uh, for people who maybe aren't as familiar with that term, you know, we're talking about their memory, decision making, all these phenomena that are associated with, with the mind. Um, and then perhaps if we turn to, to the emergence of consciousness, uh, you, you mentioned earlier you thought there were maybe some disagreements uh, in our worldview, and I wonder yeah. if this is let, where that comes in. Before, yeah. before we do that, let me say that in this, in this Santiago theory, cognition is always associated with life at all levels of life. So a, a simple bacterium is able to perceive things in the environment. It has some sensory apparatus, very, very simple sensory, uh, uh, what should I say, organs, if you wish. And, and it perceives things in the environment 
and it responds to this perception. It can move in one direction or the other, it can follow light, it, it can perceive electric impulses, some bacteria perceive magnetic fields and, and so on. So there, there is perception, there is a self-organizing cognitive response at all levels of life, long before we have uh, nervous systems and brains. And as organisms become more and more complex in evolution and have become in the history of evolution, they, uh, their physical structures are more and more complex and so are their cognitive processes. So the process of cognition or mind, if you wish, and the physical structure increase in complexity hand in hand. And at, certain, at a certain complexity, there's the emergence of coordinating organs like nervous systems and brains. And at that level of complexity, at some stage, certainly at the stage of mammals, but also with some vertebrates like birds, for example, there is the emergence not only of <coughs> awareness of the environment, which is true for all cognitive processes, but self-awareness, the awareness of a self. And cognitive scientists today talk about transitory states of self-awareness, and they call this primary consciousness. And as complexity increase, <coughs> increases into the, excuse me, we move into uh, the great apes and hominids and humans. We, we then have a permanent self-awareness and we speak about human consciousness. <coughs> and with that, with that permanent self-awareness, you, uh, you have the emergence of uh, conceptual thought, of uh, values, of, of language, and there's a whole inner world that emerges. And this is, uh, I think, where we are at the forefront of cognitive science. And, and as you say yourself in, in your paper, uh, this has been called the heart problem of consciousness research to explain how this inner world of uh, ideas, of, of conscious awareness, of thought emerges from the neurophysiological processes of the brain. That, that's where we are today. And, and in, I, I have not seen a really, uh, you know, a theory that convinces me, but, but in, in my view, in, in the work that I have studied, uh, Antonio Damasio has gone maybe the furthest in, in trying to explain this emergence of, of the inner world of consciousness. Right, and um, so it sounds to me uh, like similar to Antonio Damasio's work, there's this emphasis on the nervous system and its ability to create abstract kind of images or symbols, um, one of those right. being of, of the self. And um, it, so in, the, in this view is the idea that um, in order to have this, in order to have consciousness, and as you say, this kind of inner world of experience, there needs to be a self, there needs to be some psychological structure corresponding to the kind of organism? Well, then there needs to be, uh, according to Damasio, there needs to be an image of the self. Uh, so, so his theory basically says that in the human brain, <coughs> there are certain structures, certain neural networks that monitor the entire state of the organism. There is a neural map of our blood pressure, of, of our hormonal processes, uh, and, and in particular of our response to uh, encounters with uh, objects in the environment and, and, and uh, things in the environment. So this, this neural uh, network 
these, these neural maps are maps of the state of the organism and its response to environmental influences. And they, are, they have been developed, they have evolved so as to enable this complex organism to respond to things in a self-organizing way and to keep track of things. And uh, this is what Damasio calls the proto-self, these neural maps. They are not conscious. And then he says, when these, uh, when these unconscious neural maps become conscious, this is the process where the self emerges and he emphasizes the uh, role of emotions in this process of making the neural maps conscious. And uh, uh, he interestingly distinguishes between emotions and feelings. He says that emotion and emotion is a uh, biophysical response to uh, events, when 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 we you know when we get angry, you know our blood pressure changes, we get red in the face, and so on. So it's a physiological response which helps us in survival, which was evolved very early on in evolution. Most organisms have that an emotional response to the environment, a whole pattern of physiological processes. There's also, you know, the fight or flight response that is well known, stress is part of it and so on. So, so those are emotions. And then when we become conscious of an emotion, then it's a feeling. And the making conscience, conscious of the proto-self to become a self critically involves emotions that then become feelings. And this is why uh, Damasio says consciousness is a feeling. So, uh, no, no, uh, sorry, not consciousness, the self. The self is, is a feeling. And uh, the, the title of the book uh, in which he describes this theory is called The Feeling of What Happens. And that's actually his definition of consciousness. Uh, what happens is the environment, uh, the proto-self makes the neural map of, of what happens, and when it becomes conscious, when it becomes a feeling, then that is consciousness. But uh, uh, in my view, and uh, Damasio has not solved the hard problem of consciousness studies, because he, dis he describes he doesn't describe in detail how it becomes conscious, you know, the process of it becoming conscious. If you read his book carefully, you see that he, he does sort of a sleight of hand. He, mm -hmm. he glosses over it, you know, and I actually asked him about that. I, uh, I met Damasio many years ago at a conference and, uh, you know, right five minutes after we were introduced, I, I, said to him, uh, Antonio, I think you haven't really solved the hard problem of consciousness studies, have you? And he immediately said, no, I haven't. So, you know, he's honest about it, you know, which is, is great, you know. It, yeah. he, didn't, he didn't sort of say, well, this is the theory and that and that and that. But he said, no, I haven't solved it. So yeah. I think that's where we stand. And I think that's common as well. You know, most theories of consciousness um, will admit that there is this glossing over of the gap, which is why it's described as the hard problem in the first place, because because it's um, yeah. Yeah. yeah tricky to 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 vault that that chasm. Um, which is why you know you mentioned my uh, my paper earlier that uh, for me I'm willing to uh, grant consciousness intuitively. You know, I feel it, um, comfortable granting it to the whole natural world um, because. I think it does offer a solution, but also because we spoke earlier at the very beginning about kind of um, in the 60s, you said you kind of spiritual experiences through kind of meditation and psychedelics got you interested in these systems views. And a core aspect of that for a lot of people is the idea of is the sense of the loss of, of self and the fact that consciousness remains when the self is gone, which is 
in large part what makes me feel um, it's not necessary to have uh, yeah to have this complex sense of self in order to have consciousness. Yeah, this is this is a, a, a well known position, and and I think uh, the different theories of consciousness uh, place the heart problem the emergence of the inner world uh, at different levels of, of living systems. And so uh, what you are saying is uh, you place it at the beginning of life, right? That every, every right. living system is a conscious system. Yeah. And there are spiritual traditions or indigenous traditions that go even further and say it's there all the time. So they would say, well, a tree is alive, of course, but a rock is not alive. And they would say a rock is conscious too. And, and so matter is conscious. And so they, uh, they solve the heart problem by saying there is no gap because everything is conscious. But of course, that's not an explanation. If you say everything, everything has a certain property, then you know, the property is not explained, you just posit it. So uh, what, what I don't understand in your view of uh, what you call the living mirror theory is, well, there, there are several things I, I have problems with. And, and one is that if you associate consciousness with self-awareness, then it seems to me, uh, uh, there needs to be, well, first of all, you need to have some evidence that say there's self-awareness in cells. I don't see an evidence for that. I see an evidence that a bacterium is aware of its environment, of certain features of its environment, very limited features. And as life gets more complex, those features become more and more complex. But I don't see an evidence of a bacterium or even a plant being aware of itself. Even, even uh, animals are not aware of, it, of themselves apparently, but you know, chimpanzees are aware of themselves and apes the, in general are aware of themselves. So, so do you associate self-awareness with consciousness? And if so, what's the evidence? Yeah, so I think, yeah, this is an important maybe matter of definition, because for me, uh, self-awareness is, is not necessary for consciousness. You know, this is what I was referring to with these spiritual states um, earlier. So, you know, consciousness to me is experience, any qualitative feeling. Um, and so, you know, a human can have this experience of, of consciousness without a sense of self in, in the spiritual states we mentioned. Um, but so I, I don't think it's necessary for consciousness. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a phenomenon that appears within consciousness that is incredibly captivating to us. Um, and the average person can't imagine experience without the sense of self, I think, understandably. But it, is, yeah. it does exist, which is why, you know, I agree that um, plants aren't self-reflective or, you know, don't have those complex kind of cognitive structures that arise with nervous systems. But I would say I do think every living system does have some degree of self perception, maybe you could say, in the sense that any kind of autopoetic system, you know, needs to know to metabolize things from the external environment and not to metabolize its own membrane. You know, there is some discrimination there between the organism and the outside. Um, but that is, I agree, that's different to a complex cognitive representation of the whole organism. Yes. There is, of course, there is a, a, a distinction. This is why we talk about self-organization and and self-making. I mean, the auto in autopoiesis is, means self. So a self is very critical. And in the theory of autopoiesis, uh, the boundary is a boundary of identity. In the case of a cell of molecular identity, the cell membrane, um, defines the molecular identity of the self, of the cell. So the self is, is very important. But I think, uh, I understand you now, and, and I think it would be worth really examining the features of consciousness 
that are not self-awareness and how self-awareness is placed within those features, how it arises and so on. Uh, that would be really interesting. Now the yeah. other, the other, let me ask you the other question. The other uh, problem I had in, in understanding or accepting what you say is, you, you write, consciousness arises from the entropy resisting dynamics of living systems. It is not dependent on brains. So what you're referring to is the fact that uh, living systems create order out of disorder. We have the famous second law of thermodynamics, which says closed systems will move from a state of order to increasing disorder. And this is measured by entropy. As the uh, disorder increases, so does the entropy, which is a measure of disorder. And so, uh, the, the big discovery of, one of the big discoveries of Ilya Prigozhin uh, was that uh, he could explain how life creates order of disorder without violating the second law of thermodynamics. First of all, living systems are open systems and the second law deals with closed systems. That's a big difference. But Prigozhin showed in, in a detailed mathematical theory for which he got the Nobel Prize, he showed how a living system um, forms what he calls islands of order in a sea of increasing disorder. So the disorder is exported from the system and is dissipated. And this is why he calls living systems dissipative structures. So, so this is, I think, what you're referring to when you say the entropy resisting dynamics of living systems. But the problem I have now is that dissipative structures are not necessarily alive. There are phenomena called Benar cells that Prigogine has worked with, or so-called chemical clocks, oscillating chemical systems, which are not alive, but are dissipative structures. So this entropy resisting dynamics is not limited to living systems. It occurs before the emergence of life. And then according to you, these these non-living dissipative structures would also be conscious. Well, I, so I think in, in that line, that line alone, um, yeah, if you, if, if you take that line alone, it, it sounds like I'm saying, I'm making the point that it's only the, the, the process of entropy resistance that produces consciousness. But the, the point of that sentence was to say that the brain is kind of incidental, the brain is a secondary, you know, uh, phenomenon. The brain is a kind of important part of the network, but it's not uh, the thing that brings consciousness into existence. And so the, the theory as a whole is saying that rather than just resisting entropy or just being a dis dissipative structure, um, we can understand bounded dissipative structures like cells, like whole organisms. Um, and this is, this is best articulated in Carl Friston's free energy principle, which I write about in, in the theory. And so it's, it's the presence of this boundary um, and the fact that that boundary, um, certain parts of that network, certain parts of the boundary become kind of sensing and other parts, you know, are involved in action. And that that process, that particular way of, of um, maintaining form through minimization of free energy, that entails inference. It entails uh, the internal states kind of acting as a model, you could say, of... of the outside world or constructing beliefs about the outside world um, and then the, the kind of the, the other key point is is actually from what we were talking about a lot here is the idea of interdependence i think you know um part of the problem of, of thinking about consciousness is thinking of you know if you take the experience of red in isolation it's hard to understand how that arises out of the operation of the material world but if you understand the contents yeah. of consciousness as an interdependent framework where it's relativistic, everything is cashed out against everything else uh, in the same way that we can get reality out of a quantum vacuum through, through this kind of interdependent pattern, 
I understand consciousness to be a similar kind of pattern in this bounded structure. Yeah, yeah. In fact, there's a, a lot of similarity with with the Maturana's autopoiesis, uh, because autopoiesis is a, uh, a an autopoietic system is a system that is self generating within a boundary of its own making. That's how it is defined. So the formation of the boundary is very important. And, and I now remember that uh, very early on, Maturana referred to these systems as self-referential. Mm. So that's, that's also close to, I, I don't think I use the term in any of my books when I talk about autopoiesis, but Maturana Sorry. himself, I remember, uses the term self-referential. Right. So, that's, so that's also... Yeah, and Maturana's view was, he had this interesting idea that consciousness arises as a kind of inherently communicative social phenomenon, right? You write about that uh, yes, in your yes, books as well. Yes, that, that's right, yes. Yeah, with language. Consciousness right. arises with language, and language is a special form of symbolic communication. And he first analyzes communication, and then language, and that's the emergence of consciousness. Right. Um, so before we, we run out of time, I, I'd love to just wrap up by talking about, I guess, the kind of relevance of all of this for our situation on this planet, because you write beautifully about the kind of Gaia hypothesis, the idea that the whole ecosystem might be a, a kind of autocratic system, and a live, a live system. Um, and it seems to me that um, a lot of this perspective, it, it does resonate with, you kind of mentioned earlier, certain indigenous perspectives um, and this concept of deep ecology, where we see ourselves as really embedded in nature um, rather than being apart from it. And you, you've been a real uh, kind of, I guess, a founding figure in this concept of eco-literacy. Um, is that something where you're spending a lot of your time these days? Yeah, uh, no, not anymore. But but let me say that uh, the uh, the perspective of deep ecology that uh, we are all uh, an an integral part of the web of life. We are a strand in the web of life, which is a very beautiful uh, expression ascribed to uh, a Native American chief, Chief Seattle, uh, who, who apparently used this term, the web of life, and humans being a strand in the web of life. And this is uh, uh, fully confirmed by uh, the kinds of uh, scientific theories we have been discussing, because uh, when you study uh, life at all levels, you see that we share with all living beings not only the basic molecules of life, the basic proteins, the basic enzymes, the basic membranes, that's, that's all the same throughout life, but also the basic uh, metabolic processes, uh, the basic metabolic pathways as they are called. And if you accept this theory of cognition, the Santiago theory, you would say we share with all of living beings the basic cognitive patterns. So we are, we are really embedded in life and therefore whatever we do to nature, we do to ourselves in, in a very profound sense. So uh, the, the protection of the environment, the preservation of life, you know, from a deep ecology point of view is self-preservation. And, and of course, we naturally want to preserve ourselves. This is how life has evolved with this very strong desire of self-preservation of, of all living beings. And so knowing what we know now, uh, we know that you know, self-preservation is, you know, preservation of the environment is self-preservation. And so this is also very strong in indigenous traditions. In Native American traditions, uh, there's this famous saying of, uh, you know, the, the animals and plants uh, in the environment are all my relations. Now, if we come back to Darwin, we know that's literally true. 
They are our relations genetically. We are related. They are our cousins genetically. And so, so then this, um, uh, this creates a deep awareness of being one with the world, of uh, belonging to the universe as a whole, and, and not, not being thrown into randomness and chaos, but rather being part of a, a, a big process of life, a big symphony of life, if you wish, uh, which is you know, essentially the, the spiritual position of, of how you are aware of yourself and the world in, in a spiritual experience. Right. I was just going to say that yeah, it seems to me that the systems perspective offers a kind of naturalistic understanding of spirituality, as you say, as the kind of maybe an experience of the systems perspective as it applies to yourself and, and the greater whole. Yes. Um, James, do, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the center you are creating in, in Portugal? I'm very interested yeah. in it. Yeah, so it's Is called it the Surrender Homestead. Idea? Is it, is still it just around? an idea? No, is I it, mean we're is we're it, here right now, <laughs> and it's um it's oh, a yeah. it's an ongoing project. It's it's early stages, but it's um it's it's evolving organically. Um, perhaps you know in line with the principles that we <laughs> just spoke about. It's um, yeah. but we yeah me and my wife knew that we just wanted to kind of be in nature and 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 do kind of outreach and all of the kind of areas we've been speaking about. Um, her passion is is art and and making a space where people can come and explore different avenues of creativity while being close to nature. Mine is in in yes. the things we've been talking about and um, as well as kind of meditation and um, you know as kind of psychedelic therapy becomes more kind of openly available, that's something we hope to be involved with. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, yeah, the other day actually I was watching. There's this new documentary about Stan Groff, um, which you appear in. Uh, um, I was watching last night, um, and the work you you both did there at Esalen Institute really resonated. You know, these workshops where you would teach the kind of the Tao of physics in the morning, and then Stan would do holotropic breath work in the afternoon, and yeah. th these are the kinds of things yeah. we want to to play around with. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And, and, you know, I commend you also for the inclusion of art, which is, is very critical and there's not enough of it. I, I think we need art to uh, communicate this kind of deep ecological awareness. And uh, I, I have always had friends who are artists and I just want to show you, remind you of the cover of my book, The Systems View of Life, right. which uh, has this beautiful art of Andy Goldsworthy on, on the cover. And so I'm, I'm in communication with various artists. There's also the, the artist Tomas Saraceno, who is Portuguese. Do you know about him? No, no, no. I'll definitely look him up. No, he, he makes uh, big installations of networks made of uh -huh. uh, wires of steel and mirrors and and absolutely fantastic uh, uh installations art and has people within these networks and he calls them cloud cities and things like that yeah well worth looking up he lives in berlin now but he's portuguese Tomas oh, Saraceno. To yeah definitely well yeah. Um, and so perhaps we could talk as a uh, finish on what you've been working on at the moment, the Capra course. Um, is that where you would direct people if uh, they want to kind of follow up on this material? Yes, I, uh, the, uh, the, the Web of Life is a, a textbook which I wrote together with a friend and colleague, Pierluigi Luisi, who is a biochemist at the University of Rome. And uh, the Capra course is a course based on the book and I created it because when the book came out in 2014, uh, many academics told me they would have a very hard time teaching this, uh, using it as a textbook for a course, because it is multidisciplinary. And as you know, you know, the systems view is inherently multidisciplinary. And so, and our universities are very fragmented, you know, arranged according to different faculties and different disciplines. And so I wanted to have a model course <clears throat> to show them how this can be done. And I'm teaching it 
online so as to spread it as widely as possible. And uh, I called it Capra course for PR purposes because it's easy to remember. And so I have taught it now for five years and I have a network of alumni of about 1800 people all over the world, 75 countries all over the world. So I'm building a network of systemic thinkers and activists. And I'm saying activists because half of the course is theory, but half of the course is how to solve the world's problems from a systemic perspective. But that would be another conversation for yeah. another time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're definitely welcome anytime uh, for a follow up conversation. And I definitely recommend people go and uh, buy, you know, I mean, any of your books, but especially Systems View of Life is a wonderful summary of, of all of this work and, uh, and check out the Capra course. Yeah, thank you so much, Richard. This has been wonderful. Yeah, thank you. And good luck with your project. And let's keep in touch and let me know how it's going. Definitely. Okay, bye bye. Yeah, thank thanks you. again.